I'm going to start and I'm sure Justin will join us in, in the next five minutes or so. Um, so first of all, I just want to welcome um, you all. We've had loads of new champions join us over the past couple of weeks and I can definitely see some, some new names uh, joining us this evening. Um, so yeah, it's fantastic that you're here. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Just a bit of a recap. So every week we send two emails to the COVID champions, one on a Tuesday with the COVID dashboard that's got sort of data around the number of tests that have been conducted, uh, the number of cases on like a ward level. And then we tend to send another email out on a Thursday or a Friday just with sort of updates off the back of um, the webinar or just, just any, any new guidance that might have perhaps come out over the past few days. If you, if you can't join um, the webinars, you can always catch them on our YouTube channel. And I think Jack, my colleague, is going to pop the link in the chat box for you now. Um, you don't necessarily have to, have to watch the entire thing, but if you do think it would be useful, they are kept in a folder there, so you're, you're more than welcome to view them. And you can also email us as well at, at any point. Um, Jack is also going to pop the, the email in the chat box for you now. If you've got a question for the public health team, please, please do let us know. If you want to share any, any, any information to us, again, please feel free to do so. Um, today, so I've mentioned uh, to you previously, so we're going to have Dr Justin Varney speaking to us briefly about an update in terms of Birmingham, where, where we are with testing, um, case rates, the vaccine, etc. And then the sort of two thirds of the session is around support if you have to isolate. Um, I can see Justin, you're here. Hi, do you want to, do you want to kick off? <laughs> Yep. Hi, everyone. And you're going to see me looking slightly to my left because I'm trying to learn to use a split screen at the moment. Um, <laughs> so I've got a bigger monitor, which makes it easier for me to read things other than the laptop. But it does mean you get the most impressive beard profile. It looks very big today. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's my lockdown beard is going. So um, I'll just talk briefly about where we are in terms of, of the kind of current COVID situation. Um, we are seeing case rates coming down, which is brilliant. Uh, we're running at about 122 cases per 100,000 population. And our case rate in our over 60s is now down to about 107 cases per 100,000. So that's really good. Um, we're seeing in terms of the um, the kind of national picture, case rates are coming down across the country. Um, what I would say is it's a little bit slowing compared to, to where we would want to be at this stage. And, and there will be a lot of caution over the, the um, schools coming back next week um, and seeing what happens over March. So although we've got the national roadmap, those dates are not set in stone. And if we see case rates start to climb again, those dates will have to move back. Um, what is good news is we're seeing the impact of the vaccine uh, really play out, and that is reducing quite significantly, actually, the uh, hospitalizations. And we're just starting to see the benefit of that now play out locally with the number of people going to hospital uh, coming down, uh, which I think is really good news. Um, and we know that after the first dose of the vaccine, um, that that really reduces your chances of ending up in hospital or dying. So what we're seeing at the moment is that impact of those first doses of vaccines in care homes in the over 80s really starting to impact on people becoming severely unwell. Um, vaccine rollouts going to plan. I will put in the uh, the chat box. Uh, we've just updated the uh, the vaccine update uh, data. For this week and we publish it every week through the local outbreak engagement board um, and that's got a whole slide set with the vaccine update by ward um, by different ethnicity groups as well um, and we've also included for the first time uh, this week uh, a progress chart and I'll, I'll perhaps try and share this I don't know Holly have I got um, the ability to share uh, you should do. Um, yep, I think yes, we have. Yeah, Great. Okay. So hopefully we'll be able to show you my screen. Brilliant. Um, so, and let's try and see if we can get, oh, there we go. Wait for the, the magic button to, uh, to disappear. <laughs> so just to show you, this is the, the vaccine update in over 80s by ward. 
And really what we're trying to see is everyone getting to 90%. So you can see that actually that, and, and the three bars start with the dark blue is the 16th of February. Then I took the data out on the 23rd of February, which is the lighter blue. And then the red bar is the most recent data on the 2nd of March. And, and pretty much you can see in every area, um, things are going up and improving, which is really, really good. And we're seeing more areas getting over 90%. And, and one of the things I've kind of had in my head, I suppose, as a bar is getting more areas over 70%. Um, as the kind of first hurdle. Now we've still got areas like Newtown, um, Sparkbrook uh, and Bullsaw East, Alum Rock, which are still not there yet. Um, but you can see, and I'm not, I can't zoom in unfortunately, but hopefully on your screens is reasonable. If you look somewhere like Alum Rock, which is to the left of the screen, there's a real jump up from that first week when they were running at about 57% to now just below 65 and that's just over a three week period so we're really starting to see those numbers uh, improve uh, and in the slide pack I've done this for other age groups as well so you can see some of the trends um, but what we've also done is looked at clinically extremely vulnerable and and this is probably the group that I want to flag with you most in terms of uh, vaccine uptake is we are really um, keen to ensure that people who are clinically extremely vulnerable um, are taking up the vaccine. Now the reason this one looks a bit strange in that the yellow bar is the first extract and the grey bar is the most recent extract and in some cases the grey bar is lower than the yellow bar and that's because about two weeks ago the NHS increased the list of people that were defined as clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, and therefore, when you look at it as a percentage of everyone who's eligible, that suddenly dropped down. But it does worry me that we've got areas in the city, um, Bordesley and Highgate, um, you know, areas like Longbridge, uh, sorry, King Standing, for example, where uptake amongst people who are most likely to die if they catch COVID is still running pretty low. Um, and I think that's one of my key messages for you as champions this week is, really encourage people that you know that are clinically extremely vulnerable the people who've been shielding is, is mainly that group to get the vaccine there is a housebound service um, for people that are housebound uh, gps are now doing more vaccination in their local gp practices so there's lots of opportunities and and the key message is if last time you were asked you said no and you've changed your mind that's absolutely fine there is no judgment here. If you've thought about it and you've changed your mind and now you want the vaccine, please ring your GP and let them know um, if you're in one of these vulnerable groups so that we can make sure you, we get that jab to you as soon as possible. Because we are seeing from the data, it makes a real difference. There's information on deprivation as well. Um, but there's also information on ethnicity. Um, and I should say we're the first local authority to publish this data in this way. Um, and what you can see when you look at the ethnicity data is that uptake in our over 80s, which is the group that we've been vaccinating for longest, is lowest in our African community. But when you look at the total number of people who are over 80 and are identified as African, um, on their NHS record, that's only about 400 people. If we look at the Pakistani community where uptake's about 72%, there are 3,500 people who are identified as Pakistani and over 80. So when we look at absolute numbers of people who haven't had the jab, um, there is a much larger number of people who are of Pakistani ethnicity who haven't had it than there are from African. Um, but when you look at it as percentage, you see it's actually the, the gap is much more dramatic as a percentage. Um, and the patterns are pretty consistent across different uh, communities. What I would say, in the one uh, that I would also highlight is the traveller community. We have very, very small numbers of travellers uh, in Birmingham who are elderly. Um, we know that some of this reflects life expectancy and health in our traveller community, but it's a very, very small population. So that's why it's 0%. It's because actually there aren't uh, any travellers we have who are over 80 
um, um, so it's very, very small numbers. We've also included in these graphs um, how these have changed between the 23rd of February and, and the 2nd of March. And you can see there is improvement uh, and it's creeping up, um, but it could be a lot better. And what we really want to see is all of these over 80s, over 90%. That's the target we're aiming for. Um, but I thought that just might be quite useful to, uh, to share with you um, and just give you a sense of what's in that slide set um, in the link. So you can have a look at that. Um, someone's put in the chat about the REACT study. Um, and I'll just mention that at a moment because I think it's it has hit the media and people have got a bit excitable about it. Um, and also about the Zoe app. Um, so the REACT study is, is a sampling, it's a national survey um, and they sample a number of people in each area. Um, but when you look at actually how many people are sampled, and I was talking to, to colleagues in Samwell about this, and they really drilled down. Actually, in Samwell, there are only about 10 people that are in the study. Um, so I haven't looked at what the number is for Birmingham, um, but we expect that it, it's going to be um, probably 40, 50 people. It won't be representative. And um, therefore, looking at a single set of data from React isn't very helpful. We need to look at the trend. Um, we also are doing sewage sampling at the moment. So we're looking at um, uh, the virus fragments that are in your, uh, in your poo and in your urine. Um, we sample that from the, the sewage. Um, that's showing that case rates are coming down. So that suggests um, that's a more accurate, I suppose, picture than, than some of the national surveys. The Zoe app is an interesting one because the Zoe app is about self-reported uh, symptoms um, and it's not linked to whether someone's got confirmed uh, test or not. Um, so Zoe is the one, and I was talking with the chief medical officer about this actually on Tuesday, I think it was, because Zoe is the only large scale data collection that's showing a different direction of travel. Everything else, the sewage, the testing results, um, the majority of the, the surveillance studies are all showing we're coming down relatively evenly across the country. Zoe isn't. Zoe's showing different pictures. So they are doing some work nationally looking at why is the Zoe app reporting uh, a different picture from everywhere else, just to try and understand what, what, what the difference is really. Um, so that's where we are in terms of the numbers. I'll, I'll just touch briefly on testing in uh, education settings because I can see Deborah raised it and it is an um, uh, interesting challenge at the moment uh, to, to get your head around what's happening with testing with schools. So from the 8th of March, as children go back to school, um, children who are attending secondary school will be tested three times first through the testing site at the school um, and then they can start to access home testing kits. We're not testing children in primary schools, um, instead the offer is to test anyone who is in their family or their childcare bubble and from my point of view Deborah I don't think that excludes child minders, I think that includes child minders um, will be able to access uh, home testing kits and they are able to order those through the national order line or they will be able to access them to collect them from a series of collection sites which will be across the city. Now the collection sites at the moment are being done nationally and they'll be opening up um, through the national website. Um, the first wave of those will be uh, where we do symptomatic testing and there'll be designated time slots during the day that people can go and collect their kits. Um, we're working as a council to get kits also into our asymptomatic testing sites so that those could be collected any time between eight and six when they're open seven days a week. When people collect their kits, they have to register. So it's not you just turn up and hold out your hand and get given a kit. You will have to provide your contact details, your address, how many kits you're collecting and for who. And that's so that if there's a problem with the kits we've given you, we have to be able to get hold of you very quickly to let you know. So um, 
that's why those details are registered um, and recorded. It also helps us have a look to see um, when we're giving out kits, um, are they being used? So there's also a way of just doing that double checking that we know how where where kits are going and that you know people aren't going around and collecting loads of kits and selling them on eBay, for example. Um, but I haven't seen anything in the communication that excludes childminders, and I would consider childminders part of a childcare bubble, and that makes you eligible for them. So from my point of view, have a go. Um, what I would say is that the home testing kit to be sent to your home, there are only a certain number of kits they release each day. And it's a bit like you remember when they introduced home testing for people with symptoms um, and, and many people spent hours trying to get a kit sent because for the first week or two, there just weren't enough kits. And, and so it's a similar situation at the moment. Um, you know, the, the number of kits available is outstripped by the demand. So if you can go to a testing site, I would go to a testing site to, to certainly for this week um, and next week until there's more availability, but we are working to, to open that up as well. Um, and um, yeah, and, and Deborah, if you do find there are problems, do let us know and I'll, I'll go into bat. As you know, I'm a very strong advocate of getting testing available to childminders and, and getting more support into early years but you know the 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 um there are some national decisions on this that are sometimes challenging um yeah and and lynn just to say in the slides that i that i showed you will find that um some of the wards you can't see on the tables uh, sorry on the graphs and that's because in order to fit them on the slides i have to shrink the size of the graph but they are in the spreadsheet of the tables um, what we have also had to do is make a judgment call about which parliamentary constituency we put which ward in. So lots of the wards um, don't fit the parliamentary constituency. Um, and therefore, I've had to make a judgment call on which one goes where. So Wheelie and, C and Selly Oak, for example, could go in uh, two different parliamentary constituencies. Um, so have a look through the tables but all the wards should be there if you do find that we missed one off let us know and we'll double check but I personally do those slides because uh, at the moment it's only me that personally has access to the website to pull them off and it, it does take me about three hours a week to do them in between other meetings so if I have made a typo please let the team know and and we can always get it fixed but You'll be there in the tables. You just may not be able to find yourself on the graph. And that's just about how we have to shrink the graph at the moment to fit on the slides. Um, so I think probably, Holly May, that's, that's everything I wanted to touch base on this week. Um, final thing actually just came into my head on testing. Um, we, we met with the faith leaders this week, uh, as we do every week. And one of the things I've been saying to the faith leaders is, as they start to reopen congregational prayer, which they're able to do, and, and I've encouraged them to think about doing that from the end of March, so that we give a couple of weeks for the school situation to settle down, everyone to be able to get used to testing for schools and all of that. Um, but when they do, I've asked them to be clear with the congregation that people coming into worship should be doing a lateral flow test before they come doesn't need to be on the day of worship but in the two days before worship or on the day they need to do a lateral flow test um, and that's an extra bit that the congregation can do to support the faith setting to keep everyone safe so um, it's just so you're all aware that's what I've advised them to do uh, and said you know all of them are doing a great job trying to make sure that when you're in the mosque or the temple or the church or the synagogue you know, they've gotten the physical spacing, they're doing the hands face and space and the masks and all of that. The bit that you can do to help them is getting a test regularly before you go to worship, because it's that extra bit. Testing is the sprinkles on the cake of protection. Doesn't mean it, it, you, testing helps us um, know that today, now we're not infectious doesn't tell us we haven't got COVID it just says today we're not infectious but you still need the hands face and space 
because like any other test, it's not 100% perfect. But the more we test and the more of us that test, the more likely we are to find cases early and stop the spread of the virus. So I hope that will be a really useful thing uh, for faith leaders. And I hope <clears throat> congregations will, will respond really positively for it uh, and play their part. Um, because um, they'll be able to access testing from all the community sites. And, and as you know, we are getting more and more testing sites open. Uh, Maypole Youth Centre became a fixed site. Uh, I think it's called Oddingley Hall. Holly May will correct me if I get the pronunciation wrong as well, uh, have had that. Um, uh, and that's really helpful. Um, as Deborah's put in the chat, so that's where churchgoers can get their tests from. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, sadly, we are seeing a couple of people um, taking the mick, frankly, on this. Uh, I've seen lateral flow kits for sale on eBay. I mean, why you want to go and spend your money on eBay getting one when you can walk down to King Standing and get one for free? I don't quite know, but some people obviously feel like that. Um, and uh, secondary uh, school children will be able to start using home testing, but they've got to have done the three tests on site first. And many of the kids that are currently in school have been testing every week. So they will be the first to be able to use the home testing. So that's absolutely in line uh, with, with what's going on. Um, the home test kits, I should just say, um, do you have a specific um, label? And specific set of codes so where we have found them for sale on ebay the police are involved and they are able to track down where that kit's come from and and as deborah put in the in the in the um the code actually they they've been able to track back where this has been arrested uh, where these kits have come from so it's a really important one to just just mention in passing to people um we we do know every every kit's got a number so we can actually work out where they've come from. Um, so um, I think that's um, that's going to be helpful. Um, and, you know, the, the I think the reality is that over the next month or so, and, and certainly over the next two months, by the time we get to June, all of us will be testing twice a week. That's the reality of this, I think, is that whether you're testing in work, whether you're testing because you're at childcare, whether you're testing because you want to go to the cinema or you want to see a football match, um, I think it will become a really, really key part of this year and managing COVID until 90% of the population have all had two injections. So um, I think the ask of the faith leaders is to strongly suggest this it's not asking faith leaders to check so i'm not suggesting at all that when you go to church you've got to show your test certificate but i think it is an important thing to put out there and say as a congregation we're doing everything to support you you need to help us and getting a test twice a week or getting a test in the two to three days before you come to church is part of you paying your part to keep the congregation safe and i don't think that's an unreasonable thing to do the final thing I just say on testing is I do think over the next couple of weeks, we will also see it made much clearer to businesses um, that you uh, that businesses have to enable staff to test. And that's part of being a COVID safe business. Um, and if you're not doing it, then, you know, how can you say you're COVID safe? Um, once the provision is really there and actually people can access this really easily, then there's no excuse not to do it. Um, so I think that's a um, really important uh, point to make. Um, I'll just pick up the, the question from Kate. Um, if you're doing a home test, you upload the result, whether it's positive or negative. So it doesn't matter what the result is, you still need to register it um, when you do the test. Um, and that's really important because actually we need to know the name because then you get a text back that confirms it and, and that's what you can show. So if you need your employer or you when we get to the point where they will reopen cinemas um, and it might be and, and this is me crystal ball gazing, but there are some pilots being planned for April on events 
um, it may well be that, you know, as well as showing your ticket, you need to show your test result when you go to a gig or go to the theatre because the environments when we're inside for a prolonged period of time with people we don't live with are the highest risk ones. You know, actually being sat down in a restaurant um, inside is, is high risk because there are lots of other people in that space. Ventilation tends not to be great. Um, and therefore, if you've got one or two people in that space who've got COVID, it can spread around. Whereas if you are um, outside, we don't have that risk. Um, same is true for a theatre or for a cinema, et cetera. So I think that, you know, that's, um, you know, more of us will get used to this. But as I say, you upload your result, whatever that result is. And um, the reason LFD tests are no good for travel is that LFD is not is testing are you infectious today it's not testing are you infected so for travel i think most uh countries require you to have a pcr test not a lateral flow um and that's an important bit also about that question about someone who had symptoms got tested they came back twice negative and then the third test came positive um so two things one is um the initial symptoms might not have been COVID. Always keep that in mind. If they were very good at isolating, uh, maybe not. Um, and all of the tests, whether it's the PCR or the lateral flow, rely on the swab from the back of your nose and the back of your throat. And one of the easiest mistakes people make is they don't stick the swab far enough because we don't like gagging. And, and, you know, when you are doing the back of your throat, most of us have a gag reflex. And when we shove it up our nose to the point where we get that resistance, it makes our eyes water. And if you haven't done that, there may not be enough specimen on the swab itself. So it doesn't matter how good the lab is. If you haven't put the swab where it needs to go, it's going to give you a negative result. So, um, you know, that may well be uh, what's going on. Um, and uh, in terms of vaccination and testing, the advice at the moment is even if you've had the vaccine, you still need to test. Um, and particularly if you've only had one dose of the vaccine, because the full benefit of the vaccine comes about two to three weeks after the second dose. So very, very small number of people who've actually got that at the moment. Most people have only had one dose. Uh, and they're still waiting for the second dose. So I do think probably after Easter, there will start to emerge some slightly different guidance uh, for people who've been vaccinated. I'm also really hoping we're going to get some updates to care home visiting guidance. Um, I know lots of people really want to go and see relatives in care homes, um, and I've asked for some clarity on um, the outbreak guidance, because at the moment, if there's a single case in a care home, all visiting stops. Um, and I've asked for some clarity on if every all the residents have been vaccinated and they've all had their two doses um, and the case is in a member of staff, uh, can we have a slightly different approach? But we're waiting to see whether uh, national colleagues will agree with me on that or not. So I think I've covered everything. Holly May, I've probably talked for far too long, but hope that's been useful for everyone. And I'll hand back to you for, for the next bit, if that's OK. Thank you, Justin. That, that was really, really useful. I'm just going to share, share my screen. Bear with me a second. Okay, so can everybody can everybody see that? Yep. Fab. So before we go into the interactive um, workshop, I just want to quickly recap um, and set a bit of a scene, really. So, so, so when when should when should you isolate? And uh, I'm sure I'm sure you all know this. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this really quite quick. Um, if you have symptoms of COVID nineteen, you should isolate and book a test. Uh, those symptoms are a high temperature, a new continuous cough, or a loss or change to your sense of smell or taste. Um, you might also need to isolate if you've tested positive for COVID. Perhaps you didn't have symptoms. Um, if you live with somebody that has symptoms or tested positive for COVID, you would also need to isolate. 
Um, obviously, there are almost extent extensions of your household. Perhaps you're in a support bubble or a, or a childcare bubble. If you've been in contact with somebody that is positive for COVID, again, you'd need you would need to isolate. And the same with if, if they have symptoms. Um, the, other, the last reason would be if you've, if you've been told by test and trace that you've been in contact with somebody in the past 48 hours that's had COVID, perhaps at a, a close distance, you, you would also be asked to isolate. Um, so, so for how long? So if you, if you test positive, you must isolate for 10 full days since your symptoms started. Um, if you didn't have symptoms, it would be 10 full days since, since you had your positive results. And the people that you live with would also need to self-isolate as well. Um, if you develop symptoms whilst you're isolating, arrange to have a COVID-19 PCR test and, and keep isolating whilst you're waiting for your results. If it's positive, regardless of where you are in your original 10 day isolation period, you and your household will need to still isolate for 10 full days from this point. So essentially you could be isolating for more than 10 days altogether. Um, it is a legal requirement. Um, you know, if you, have, if, you are, if you are positive, or you've been asked by test and trace, um, you, you must isolate, which, which is why we put this, this session together today. Uh, you know, we understand and recognize that isolating isn't always practical. I mean, there are lots of intricate reasons why it might be difficult. Um, so it's really important to share the resources that we have. Um, just, just so everybody knows, you know, if they do need support whilst they're isolating, where can they get in and who can they contact? Um, so that's enough of me talking. If if you would all be so kind is to go to menti.com on your on your tablet, on, on your phone, on your laptop. Um, you can also press the link that Jack's gonna put in the chat um, right now for you. Um, yeah, the code is 6519182. I'll just give it a couple of minutes for everyone, everyone to join. And you should still see my screen with the Mentimeter presentation as well. So we've got two people joined us. If anyone's having problems, please please do um, let me know. Well, Shaban has put a lovely cross on the screen. I did that last week as well. I drew, I drew like a, a line on the screen by accident. <laughs> Got four people, five people. Ollie May, just to confirm, when everyone goes to menti.com, do they get this? They should be seeing something which says please go to Menti with a light heart on it or should they get a different screen? Um, no, that, that should be okay. That should be what you should see. So they should see something that looks a bit like the screen you've got up in front of us now. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So you're in another month, we're all going to be Menti experts, aren't we? Yeah, <laughs> yes, definitely. So I'm... We've got, we've got 13 people, so I'm, I'm going to move to the, to the first question. There's seven all together. If you're still joining, you know, please do, please do sign on to Menti. OK, so do you think your community know when they should isolate? There's no correct, there's no correct answer. If, if perhaps they don't you know, please do let us know. Um, so yeah, yes, no or somewhat. So quite a lot in the somewhat, four yes and one no. Sorry, I can't press anything for some reason. As in you can't press on yes, no or somewhat? Yeah, I can't click on anything. It just doesn't give me uh, an option. I can't click anything. It's just, I don't know, as, as if it wasn't, you know, like a clickable link. Oh, okay. I've got the um, same problem. Have you, I know it sounds daft, but have you given it a refresh? The hot, the old on, on and off. <laughs> uh, okay. If not, I can, I can give, I can give it a refresh my side as well. All oh, right. Yeah. 
No, I can only see results, so I can't vote at all. Okay, let me move on to the next one and see if it changes for you. Perhaps did did you, did you join after this question started? Uh, no, no. Oh no, that's worrying. Okay. <laughs> but before I move on, would anybody like to come off mute? And if, if you have put somewhat, perhaps just explaining a bit a bit more about that. You know, what what aspect is it about isolation that perhaps people don't perhaps understand? Again, there's there's no right or wrong answer. It'd just be great to get some feedback. Hi, yeah, um, it's Becky. Um, Hi, Becky. I think for me, I think the you know the recent announcement with the roadmap has left people a little bit confused, especially between what they can do right now and what they can do between now and the eighth. I think a lot of people have already moved to what they can do on the eighth of March and what they can do on the 29th of March. So I think I think it's just a little bit of confusion, but it. It's not with many people, but I have come across people who are sort of like doing things slightly outside of the rules, but I think it's because they don't quite understand because there's quite a lot of changes and isn't there coming up in this month itself. Yeah, that, that's really useful, Becky. And I, I think I think I I I, I agree as well. You know, some people have heard the announcement and, and perhaps have almost preempted that it's, you know, it, it, it started now. Um, but I guess regardless of whether we're in a, in a lockdown or not, you know, if, if you have if you have symptoms, you must you must isolate. So I guess we just need to keep pushing that that message um, out into communities. And um, there's quite a lot of people that are still having a problem getting onto Mentimeter. I'm going to go to the next question and see if, if that solves it. And if not, I'll, I'll try and resolve it for you. Holly, can I, can I mention something, Holly? Oh, hello. Can I mention something? Of course, yes. Yeah, my my name's Andrew Holly. Um, I don't think in our case, it's that people don't understand. Okay. I think it's that they just don't want to do it. And uh, we've got a sad, very sad case at the moment where um, people that we knew were flaunting the rules yeah. um, and they uh, contract, well, one, somebody in their thirties got COVID, passed it on to parents who were, in their 60s, both were critical. One's out of danger, the other one is still critical. And they all will point to one person in, in particular in the family. So, and it's kind of everybody knows what what they've been doing, but they don't even with, even with um, them being as poorly as they were, they're out of hospital, they still don't have that sense that they can't be, you know, they're, they're, they're just not following the guidelines. So I don't think it's that they don't understand. I think it's that they just don't want to do it. That's really useful information as well, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I'm going to Oh, Hi. sorry. Oh, uh, it's Linda. I was just going to say, because I work in a school, yeah. um, we find that families don't understand um, when to isolate we have children coming into school with symptoms yeah. or we'll have or there'll be a family member at home but children will still come into school okay. uh, or if we send in a child home they'll say well I don't have to take the other children home do I mm, yes you do <laughs> again that's incredibly useful and I'll definitely speak to sort of the team that look after school settings and, and education around that as well. Thank, thank you for that feedback, Linda. Yeah. No well, I've had a situation, Holly, where mm -hmm. uh, someone told me that because they they had to go to work, even though they told work that they someone tested positive in their household um, and they were told they had to go to work and they had to do the job um or they you know lose out on their money which they can't you know so just on that one holly if i can just jump in while i'm still with you Re really important one if you hear stories like that of businesses that are forcing people to come in and saying if you're not going to come in you ain't going to get paid please get them to report it through the council website it's anonymous so they can do it like the whistleblower but we actually, one of the things the government did was put in some really hefty fines and some really kind of good penalties for businesses 
Um, so if we find businesses that are doing that, we will come down on them like a ton of bricks. Um, but we need to know. So if you do get that reported, please encourage people to use the anonymous reporting line through the council whistleblowing site, um, because if we know about it, we can do something about it and, and we can try and help. Thank you, Justin. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to move on to the, the next question. Fingers crossed everybody can respond. Please do let me know in the chat. And this is, you can, you can type whatever you like. Um, I think you can type up to three things. So what prevents someone from isolating? We, we probably have gone over some of this already. Um, if you want to pop anything extra in there, please, please do feel free. Got lots of wages. Jack, would you be able to put the whistleblowing link in the chat box? Yes, I will. Just do Thank that. you. live alone and have no support for shopping. And again, there are so many support services out there, but it's just, yeah, getting that message out there. But that's a, that's a really good one. Lack of understanding of financial support. There's a lot of ones about financials here, which is, which is good because that's what we're going to go over today. inconvenient. Right, I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, so you can tick as or press as many options as, as you've heard of. Um, have you heard about the support that is available to people when isolating? So, you know, select, select all of them. If you've heard of them all, um, if not, just select one. Um, Three of them are financial, three of them are more around support if you need groceries or you need to get some medicine from the pharmacy, for example. Interesting. So at the minute, the majority of people know about the financial support, but not about the extra support. That still seems to be the case. Thank you. We'll, we'll move on to the next question. So in your opinion, is the financial support available satisfactory? You've got yes, absolutely, somewhat, passable and not at all. Majority saying somewhat. That's really interesting. Thank you. And the next question, I guess we'll go into this a bit more detail. Um, so if, if you thought the financial support needs in, improving, I know some of you said it's passable or it's OK, you know, how, how, how could it be improved? And again, it's, it's an open box. You, you can write, we can write what you like. Uh, there's no right or wrong answers, um, it'd just be really good to get some feedback. Needs to be more personalised.
So some of this may be covered. So we've got the, the wonderful June Marshall on the call. Um, I'm very I'm very conscious about time. I don't want to go over half six, but some of this will be covered by June um, shortly. Um, but, but thank you very much for your responses. Um, we'll move on to the next question. So this is in general, this isn't just, is not just financial support. So in your opinion, what extra support is required by your community when isolating it and it can be anything um again open text box please feel free to to write what you think knowing where to find the support. If someone has been told to isolate by test and trace, or oh, I've lost it, maybe they should be offered help at that point. That's a, that's a really good idea. daily phone calls, support for people who live alone, large families struggling with young children at home and about how to get support. And help applying for the support, that's, that's good. Hmm. I'm just conscious about time, so I'm, I'm going to I'm going to move on if that's OK, but these are all fantastic. Thank you so much for the feedback. Um, that's really, really helpful. So that is the end of the Mentimeter aspects of the presentation. Um, I presume you can all see still see my screen. Um, June, um, would you like to talk to everybody about the financial support that's available? Uh, and I think that might help answer some of the queries and the questions that have come up uh, as well. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you, June. Perfect. I'm loving the blue cross in the middle of the screen. I, I know. Someone's such an artist, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks, Holly, for letting me um, come along or inviting me to come along and just talk to um, the champions about some of the support that's available. Um, I have to be honest and tell you, I'm not an expert. Um, you'll see my title there is Customer Experience Manager. I've just been working with um, the contact centre, providing advice to the emergency line, and I'll go into that in a minute, about what benefits advice is available for um, people who are impacted by COVID, and also what support's available for those people that are isolating. And I'll also touch on what other support is available and how to access it. So let's move on. I was delighted to see that a lot of you knew about these payments, which is all good. So that means I don't um, um, I don't need to go into great detail. But what you will see is I've identified two elements which I thought would be useful for you all. So the test and tra trace support payments, they're otherwise known as self-isolation payments. So um, I've just put there what the, the rules are, if you like, around them. So for people on a low income who must legally self-isolate for 10 days and cannot work from home during that period, they were launched from the 28th of September. And as far as we're aware, they're currently available till the 31st of March. Um, there is an element of you being able to backdate it if your um, application takes a while to process, but I'm hoping that isn't the case. There's support there for businesses. So if you've got any businesses in your local area that need support, um, and that web page there, which is on the .gov website, includes all the details about what financial support, oh, something, Jack's just posted something which has just taken my screen out. Um, <laughs> and what sort of financial support and practical practical support is available for businesses, including how to order lateral flow tests. We've heard a great deal of that earlier. So there's some more information there on that web page. Let's go on. 
Thanks, Holly. So um, as many of you will already know, if you've been involved in the test and trace or applied for any of the test and trace 500 pound grants, there is an eligibility criteria um, and it is restricted to people who meet all of the following criteria. This criteria hasn't set, been set by the local authority. It's very much been set by government. Um, so it, it, it does mean that you have to demonstrate and have proof of all of the information all of the elements, um, which means you have to self-isolate. So you have to have been told to stay at home and self-isolate by the NHS test and trace team. You are in, you are in employment, either employed or self-employed. You're unable to work from home and will lose income as a result. And I know that was some of the factors earlier that people were highlighting. And you're currently receiving any of those benefits which are listed below. So there is an eligibility criteria. And as I said, that's not a local authority decision. That was a government decision. Um, and that's a national eligibility criteria. Let's move on. Support make payments and how to apply. Um, so it is quite simple if you've got all of that information, basically. Um, so um, if you look there, there is a, a web, web address and the, we do encourage you to apply online because you can then upload all of your information at the time of the application. Um, if you don't upload your information at the time of the application, it will result in delays. So it is useful to, you know, do your homework, um, find out about what is available, find out what information and eligibility um, information you need to upload and have it ready. You can also call our contact centre. So there is a telephone number there, which is our benefits line. Um, I, have no under, I have no idea why it's option one and then option three. It'll be something to do with what other options are available on that line. But they also can help you complete that. If anybody in your communities has difficulty completing that form, they can provide advice and they can also help up in um, creating that application on their behalf, on the citizen's behalf. But again, they would need to make sure that the um, advisor who is doing that for them gets the evidence to upload. Let's go on. Ooh. There we go. So just a bit more on this evidence, to be honest, your notification from the NHS test and trace team asking you to self-isolate, and it is a unique eight-digit ID number. Your bank statement showing the account details where your payment would be made. So this is what is really required when you make a, either you make an application or you talk to our team and they make an application on your behalf. Your proof of employment and confirmation from your employer that you can't work from home. And if you're self-employed, evidence of self-assessment returns, trading income and proof that your business delivers services which can't be undertaken without social contact. Go on. No, you're all right. Go on. So there are some discretionary payments and these are considerations that, um, you know, if people have gone through the um, test and trace support payments and, you know, may have been rejected for whatever reason. So there are some other considerations and basically we consider people who have applied for a benefit or been refused and have made an appeal against the decision for a discretionary payment. Um, so as long as they meet the other statutory and discretionary criteria, there is an option there to actually, there's a discretionary payment available that is considered. The same obviously will apply to persons from abroad who are excluded from claiming benefits, but meet all of the other statutory and discretionary criteria. Applicants who have a gross weekly earnings figure of no more than £372 per week, which is 40 hours at £9.30, which is the um, living wage, they'll be considered for a discretionary payment. Um, also, people will be considered for a discretionary payment if they're an applicant would suffer financial hardship if a payment is not made. But you will have to prove evidence of that. And all applicants must have capital less than 6,000. So there are additional payments available. Just to finish that off, test and trace support payments, full-time university students. So universities were given a hardship fund um, of 250 million. So if you are aware of any university students who are um, you know, struggling financially because they're not at university or you know, are in any other situation, um, and the universe and they haven't applied to their university, encourage them to go to the university in the first instance. But if their university is unable to assist, then they can apply, provided they meet some of that criteria that we've already gone through. And just to remind you then, um, that's how you apply that the link is there for everybody to apply. So let's move on. So the other thing that um, I was asked to come and talk to you about, and the reason I was asked is because I 
um, have worked with adult social care for a number of years in a communications and engagement role. And since last March, essentially the start of the pandemic, I've been supporting them on making sure that um, staff and citizens and service users get all of the latest information about what is, you know, what support's available for them and how we can help them. Those service users we've been working with are those known to adult social care predominantly. Um, because rightly or wrongly, there's an expectation that all of the other information for other citizens will feature on the web. So just to run over this support for vulnerable citizens, there was an emergency phone line created um, for citizens in March 2020 to um, support clinically extremely vulnerable citizens and the telephone numbers there. And I know all about that because I helped train the advisors to get it launched last March at very short notice. So CUV citizens are those citizens who've been advised by the NHS to isolate due to be due to being classed as clinically vulnerable. So some of the support that our emergency advice line actually offers um, are supermarket delivery slots. So if somebody is classed as CEV or is on the shielding list, the shielding um, patient list, as it's now been added to across the city, um, they are eligible for those priority supermarket delivery slots. Now, um, all supermarket, I can tell you, because I know it came up earlier as shopping support. So there are a number of supermarkets and I'd love to, I'll try and remember all of them. So there's definitely Tesco's ads, Asda, Waitrose. Um, oh, I'm going to struggle now with the rest of them. Definitely Iceland. Um, and there's another two supermarkets and it's all available on the website if you wanted to have a look and just check on that. But they've got all the data and they will be able to identify if somebody's classed as CV, if they wanted to do an online food shop, for example. So our advisors help citizens with actually registering for online food shopping um, and actually help that, that, that arrangement for them. In extreme emergencies, we do offer emergency food parcels, but it's got to be dire emergencies, unfortunately, just because the local authority doesn't have, you know, the funding to um, deliver food. And we have had some very, very, very sad stories um, come to our advisors. Um, and unfortunately, we have had to make emergency food deliveries. But when you speak into our um, emergency line, particularly for those people who are CV, um, we go through all of these options and look at what other routes and what other options are out there for people. The other thing we would do is also sign post to appropriate organisations. I know somebody mentioned earlier the NHS Responder Service, um, so that's available. The Active Wellbeing Society, um, otherwise known as TORS, um, and I think I've got a, a slide on TORS in a moment. Um, we do in um, during the conversation, a number of different things, as you can appreciate, come out. Um, and it, we have, on a number of occasions this year, referred people to adult social care, because whether they're known to the organisation or not, or known to adult social care or not, what they're asking for support on um, has actually rang alarm bells. And just so you know, there's some managers, including myself, that we manage, um, if you like, a live chat with our advisors. So if at all they get any concerns or, you know, they get that call gets escalated to us. Um, so we can make sure that citizens get appropriate support when needed. And just to give an example about that, we had an elderly gentleman who I in the summer was about 87 years old, living alone, contacted us, said he couldn't get any food. Um, we said, right, OK. And he hadn't got hadn't got facilities to do online shopping. Um, we arranged for an emergency food parcel to go out to him because he hadn't got it, hadn't eaten for two days. Um, and when we were in the conversation with him, what he told us was he's living in a house. And if we are going to arrange emergency food parcels, don't send him anything for a fridge or anything that needs to be cooked on a cooker because he doesn't have them. Um, he only had a kettle and a microwave. So this man was living on pot noodles basically, um, is what he told us. Um, so obviously that nobody should be living in that, those sort of conditions. So he was referred to adult social care for further support. Um, so that's, you know, a positive thing that came out of that. Obviously, um, we will signpost to the Birmingham Children's Trust if it's a children's issue. Um, and, you know, if there's some areas there. And there's also um, British Red Cross, British, British Red Cross um, that we can refer to. So we, we refer to different organisations who can help. So if we can just move on. Here we go. Um, one of the things I was asked for, um, uh, what we do about loneliness and social is isolation, obviously a lot of people are experiencing um, social isolation and loneliness, and that's increased during the pandemic, uh, during sort of COVID, and it's increased massively. 
Um, so citizens may feel isolated for a number of reasons, and this is all on the website and it's from the local government association. So there was some existing pre-existing factors there, pre-COVID, um, age, where you live, those who live alone, obviously. Those who loan alone, I've put there. I meant that's supposed to say live alone. Apologies for that typo. Um, those who have got existing factors, but they've been exasperated. I've been practicing saying that word all day by COVID. So, you know, with the greatest respect, we are well aware that caring responsibilities in the city have, you know, gone up massively. Um, and carers have found themselves caring when they weren't a carer previously or they found themselves caring full-time when before it was only a, on a part-time basis because daycare centres, for example, were open. So, you know, there are all different factors there. And also there's new and emer in, you know, emerging factors around social distancing measures, advice. You know, people are getting very stressed. And I know colleagues in the local authority are struggling, um, are struggling with some of the um, COVID restrictions. And that is causing them to feel isolated. We've also got, you know, and we've got employees that last March um, in the contact centre, we've got 350 or so contact centre advisors. Within a few days, we turned them all around and, you know, made them all homeworking, never been done before. Um, we got them all homeworking. We've now got people who are feeling really, really isolated because they might live alone. And, you know, coming into the office was their lifeline. So, you know, there are some new emergency, emergency factors that are kicking in. If we can just move on. So what we, I mentioned the Active Wellbeing Society earlier, and they're absolutely amazing, and a voluntary organisation that the City Council is working in partnership with. Um, and this is who we would refer most citizens to. Um, but people can self-refer. They've got a website, I've put the details there. I've told you how to do it. But they are absolutely amazing. The voluntary sector have been phenomenal throughout COVID um, and working in partnership with the local authority. So they're a community benefit society to support local communities. And I know some of the comments made earlier were about giving people support in their local area. They work in partnership with us and they'll coordinate em emergency food support. They're providing clothing to those in need and more importantly they will provide a telephone support to citizens who are feeling isolated and vulnerable which is really really important and you know it's something that I know is in great demand and um, all of that can be found on their website um, so please you know share the information with your um, in your communities with people you know um, it is really really important that people know there is somebody out there that they can talk to um, and people are generally feeling you know they have up and down days so it's worth getting the help if they need it and that's for me that's all me thank you very much June I'm just going to stop sharing um, my screen I know mm. I'm, aware, I'm aware we've gone over I'm, I'm terrible with my time keeping I'm, I'm so sorry everybody we have a, have had a couple of questions in the chat which I don't know if you could answer perhaps yes June. no I'm just looking at them now so um Susan Whitmarsh um you're absolutely right people wouldn't necessarily have to trawl through the internet which is why we've got the emergency phone line they are more than welcome to phone it and our advisors will provide as much support as they're able to do so. And they have been doing since um, March last year. So they're there. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? We all went home, thought we were setting this line up for six weeks or whatever it was, and it's still going very strong, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> June, if, if somebody were perhaps was, was you know, actually too poorly to even perhaps give somebody a ring for, for 10, 15 minutes, are they able to backdate their payment? There is an element of backdating the test and trace payment, and that can only go to when the test and, test and trace payment was um, launched, and that was the 28th of September. It wasn't available before that date. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's just have a look at the next one because I'm very conscious of time. I don't want to keep you any longer. Who should I elevate something to make this happen? I believe there's um so um Steve, in that instance, I think you would be um in your right to actually consider a, applying for a discretionary payment and appealing it. Um I don't know what you what information you get back if it is rejected. Um I would hope on that rejection um for your application that they give, gave you some advice about that. Um if not, ring the benefits advice line on the number that I shared earlier. And they will be able to advise you about what to do and who to go to. They are the experts in taking these calls and how and supporting citizens. So, what about people who are isolating, or are we coming to that? I don't understand that question. I'm sorry. No. So, so all, all the support, um, all the support mentioned, Sandra is is for people um, who, who are isolating. 
Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll share the I'll share the slide deck uh, with you all, so you've got the contact numbers. And also in our email this week, we will either provide a document or, or clearly state the different types of support that are available and, and how you access these. And you can share them with your communities via WhatsApp, Facebook, yeah. you know, however you like. But at least you've got the numbers then that you can you can pass on. Um, Steve, I tell you what, give us, drop us an email, um, the, the, you know, the COVID-19 community champions email, and, and we, we can put you in contact with the right person. Because, um, yeah, you definitely should have, should have had something back. Um, oh, I see, Sandra. So, so yeah, there, there was one slide around people that are extremely clinically vulnerable, sorry, clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, and there's a certain number that, that those people can call, but the rest of the services are available to anybody that's isolated. Yes. So we'll make, absolutely. That, we'll make that clear in our email. Oh, sorry, June. No, I was just about to say absolutely. Um, and yes, they, there was a, there is some additional services available to clinically extremely vulnerable. Equally, um, as a result of the recent government, um, if you like, risk assessment factors, the, the number in Birmingham has um, gone up significantly. So there are a great deal more people that are eligible for all of that support as well directly. Thanks, June. Um, if there's no more... Um questions i think we'll, we'll draw it to a close simply because i've already gone 10 minutes over i, I do, I do apologize and thank you so much for staying on more the than line. happy to answer any questions afterwards if they want to get them to you holly oh that's fantastic yeah if anyone does think of anything after this meeting i know i i'm like that please do email us and we'll, we'll definitely give you give you the answer and yet yeah, steve drop us an email with that screenshot and we'll be, we'll be more than happy to to help you and um, as i say so the recording will go onto our youtube channel for for anyone to to view it if they if they, if they need to um, and in the emails that we'll send out tomorrow, there'll be a list of all the support that's available to you as well. Um, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for giving your feedback as well um, via Mentimeter. It's, it, yeah, it's so important and so helpful for us. Um, yeah, you're, all, you're all absolutely fantastic. So thank you. Um, and yes, have, have a lovely evening. And thank you very much, June. No worries. Nice Take to talk everybody. to you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks very much, June. Bye-bye.